This segment is brought to you by GoToAssist. So, um, that didn't work out so well, but, but uh, suffice it to say, and, and what we're seeing here is, is the green is your averages and the whites are the spikes when uh, packets and other fun stuff happens and really anything, not just Wi-Fi, anything that operates in 2.4 gigahertz as well as microwaves and, um, and it's pretty cool because my built a tool for 120 bucks which otherwise costs like 10 grand. So uh, we've got those at cost here as well as a benefit to noise bridge and maybe it could cover the cost of a new microwave. <laughs> all right. We don't buy stuff. Don't need a microwave. Yeah, all right. All right. I hear you. I think we can, uh, we can make that happen. Okay. So where am I? Okay. So there are lots of different bands in the ISM band or, or sets of spectrum that uh, interest us. These are the three most interesting right now. Uh, 902 to 928 in region two only. We'll get to that in a second. 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz. We just call that the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. And uh, 5.725 to 5.875, kind of a narrow slice. A lot of fun stuff can happen in it. We call that the five gigahertz band in Wi-Fi. And this is all, you know, handled by uh, the International Telecommunications Union or the ITU. They're an agency set up by the United Nations to uh, do standardization on uh, shared global resources of telecommunications, whether that's radio, satellite, uh, landlines, other fun stuff like that. Yes? No worries. <laughs> oh, no worries. Again, if you have questions, just raise your hand uh, or throw stuff. Um, and the ITU sets up these different regions, uh, one being Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and the former Soviet Union. Uh, region two being here in North and South America, Greenland and the Pacific Islands, and then region three, Asia and everywhere else. Yes? Uh, could you explain what happened to the microwave? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not familiar with, with the situation over there. Yeah. Uh, I know that if we had a mi working microwave and maybe it was closer, the, uh, you'd see the spectrum analyzer freak out. Um, so, so anyway, those are the different regions and I bring this up because I mentioned that the 900 megahertz spectrum was only for region two, which is North America. And that's how we transition to talking about 802.11 standards. Okay. We know them as the lettered standards. This one, you probably never heard of, uh, the Wi-Fi legacy. You see, it turns out this, this great ubiquitous technology that we take for granted every day actually came from cash registers in Norway. Huh? I know, in 1991, AT&T started work on it, and they were calling it Waveland. And it's now known as Waveland Classic, but basically, it was a wireless technology that operated under that 900 megahertz spectrum, and it was developed in the Netherlands as a technology to wirelessly equip cash registers, because why not, you know? Uh, and it was uh, as slow, as in one to two megabits per second. And that's, and that's, not even, that's theoretical maximum. We're not even getting into the overhead of the protocol. So we really don't even consider this one Wi-Fi, but it, it, that's how it was born, and I find that fascinating. Since then, in 1997, uh, the actual first specification, IEEE 802.11 TAC 1997 came about, and, um, and that, again, same as, as the original one, had a, um, had a throughput of one to two megabits per second. Again, as slow. In fact, it's, it's pretty much deprecated now. We don't really use it. Um, in 1999, that's when two competing IEEE standards came out. Uh, 802.11a, which operated on the five gigahertz spectrum and offered a uh, maximum of 54 megabits per second came out. It was pretty cool because it used this thing called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, which is just a way to get a lot of bits to be happy together. And it's kind of the same technology that's even currently in use in, well, I guess it's WiMAX, but that's dead. Uh, but I'm so excited to welcome back a fond sponsor of ours, GoToAssist by Citrix. You guys know that working in IT is unpredictable and challenging. The firewalls going off at the same time that you're getting calls from management about the thing you told them not to click. Meanwhile, everyone's expecting you to get everything done without breaking what's already there. 
I know, I've been there, and that's why I am so excited about GoToAssist by Citrix. It helps you stay on top of it all. GoToAssist is software as a service and purpose-built, giving you more control over your IT world. You can use the world-class remote support to solve your users' problems quickly from anywhere. And GoToAssist Monitor brings customizable dashboards displaying performance of everything on your network, plus proactive alerting allows you to fix small issues before they become a huge headache. GoToAssist is so easy to use. You're going to have it up and running in minutes. It's by Citrix, a leader in IT. I've used GoToAssist in my sysadmin jobs before, and man, do I wish I had this latest version back then. Sign up for your special 30-day free trial today. Visit GoToAssist.com and click the Try It Free button and use the promo code HAK5. Again, that's GoToAssist.com with promo code HAK5. Currently in use in, well, I guess it's WiMAX, but that's dead. Uh, but Powerline Networking as well as your ADSL modem if you're at home, and if you have one of those, my, my sympathies. Um, but uh, it, inherently, because of the way that it operated on the higher frequencies, it had a uh, lower signal range, it didn't penetrate walls as well, and some people would consider it late to market. Uh, whereas 802.11b, uh, where, where's, where's B? It doesn't exist anymore. Whereas 802.11b is awesome. So it runs on the uh, 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, and it does not use orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. It uses this other term, which I don't remember right now. And it had some major limitations in that the way that the, uh, the multiplexing worked, it added so much overhead to it that even though it had a theoretical maximum of 11 megabits per second, nowhere near as much as uh, A, it had um, it, you, the best you could really do is six to seven megabits per second, but it was quote unquote on time and is known as what uh, what we know today as the uh, the first mainstream Wi-Fi. It was the one that caught on because it was easy to use and it and it really was a vendor thing and we could talk about that all day. Uh, but since then, 802.11g has come on the scene. It's best of both worlds between A and G in that it uses the awesome OFDM stuff that we talked about in A on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum of G, or I'm sorry, of B, and um, you know, okay, so it may have some problems in dense areas like San Francisco with overlapping channels and things like that. And sure, there was a whole early adoption of a draft specification thing, but otherwise, it's actually a pretty cool technology. Uh, in 1999, 802.11n came out, and that's pretty cool because it has a theoretical maximum of 600 megabits per second. Real world, you're really talking about 150 to 300. Um, it uses both spectrum, though. It uses the 2.4 gigahertz of uh, B and G, as well as the 5 gigahertz spectrum that A used. It widened the bandwidth, whereas uh, 802.11 uh, B and G used f uh, 22 megahertz wide channels. It used 40 megahertz wide channels. So think about it like with just fatter serial pipes, um, as well as having backwards compatibility with G. And then so I talk about how since they used uh, fatter pipes or, or a wider set of spectrum, uh, that's kind of like the, the you know just the bigger serial. Well. What's better than serial is when you do parallel on top of that, and that's where we got MIMO, which is multiple input, multiple output. It's pretty cool technology that allowed them to have you know, uh, up to four antennas transmitting and receiving, and kind of this parallel operation that makes things go theoretically a lot faster. There's a lot of other cool stuff about N, like pre-coding and, um, and uh, spatial multiplexing and, and uh, diversity coding. It all basically boils down to this cool stuff called beam forming, and that's probably a way different discussion than uh, Wi-Fi hacking. But uh, if you're interested, we could like have that discussion. It's pretty cool stuff. Otherwise, the Wi-Fi of the future is coming in 2001 question mark or 201. Anyway, it's uh, got a theoretical maximum of one gigabit per second, and even wider channels this time, going from 40 to 80. And even 160, so you can see what's happening here. There's just like, all right, just use more. Um, and then even more MIMO, going from uh, you know, 2x2, 3x3, and 4x4 to adding 8x8. Uh, eight eight. So you're going to imagine just some ridiculous machine with like 16 antennas coming out of it, using 160 megahertz per channel, taking up all of it. And if you thought trying to get a stable connection in San Francisco is fun now, <laughs> Yeah, uh, but AC is headed here. It's going to support the hell of it, and it's pretty cool. I get, just got a chance to talk to the IEEE guys about it, and and uh, I'm super stoked. Already, like Broadcom and some other vendors have um, built some system on chips for them, 
uh, but really they're not even talking about it coming out until 2015. We'll probably see a draft next year. So let's talk about Wi-Fi channels. Um, 802.11 A, B, G, and N, they, they slice up their channels. We were talking about how that, that fat pipe, you know, the, uh, the 22 megahertz, the, um, sorry, it's getting a little chilly. The 22 megahertz, the 40 megahertz, the 80, as it goes on and on and on. Basically, what those are is they've taken that big, uh, big set of spectrum and they've decided, hey, let's just slice that up so you can operate different access points and devices on different channels and everybody can be happy. And so the way that those work is, that, uh, for instance, on 802.11b, the in, in 4 gigahertz spec, they use 22 megahertz wide channels. And each channel is separated, and, and you really can't see it, it's like just a pixel, about uh, 5 megahertz of unused spectrum. It's what we call white space. Um, there's always a lot of fun stuff in the news about people trying to use white space and interfering with stuff. But it's there so that channel 1 doesn't interfere with channel well, in this case, six, actually. And we'll get to that now, because we're going to talk about overlap. Hey, look at how that worked out. So channel one is centered at 2.412 gigahertz. And since it's 22 megahertz wide, that means that it begins at exactly 2.4, and it ends at 2.422. So channel two, being centered at 2.417, begins five megahertz past where the previous one began, the next one begins five megahertz past where the previous one began, and so on and so on. And what happens is by the time you get to, well, channel 14 is a little different, but by the time you get to channel 14, what you have are you only have four discrete channels, four channels that don't overlap, and that's why people prefer to use channels 1, 6, 11, and we can't use 14 here unless we're hackers. Or we did say there was no FCC people here, right? All right, cool. So let's do a demo on channels. And I just threw up the commands here so that I do not forget. <laughs> 